welcome to the Family Office webinar. My name is Hani Abwali, and I'll be your host today. I'm dialing in from Hong Kong. David Darst is a senior advisor at the Family Office and a great mentor of mine and many of my colleagues at the Family Office. David has decades of experience in managing through downturns and market crashes. He's authored 13 books on investing, taught at both Harvard and Yale while working over the past 40 years, first at Goldman Sachs for 20 years, then at Morgan Stanley for 17 years, and most recently at the family office since 2017. Now, before we start, allow me to give you a quick overview of the family office. At the family office, we've been preserving and growing the wealth of individuals and families in the GCC for the last 15 years. Our role is to invest our clients' wealth in international markets outside of the GCC. And our focus is primarily on wealth preservation on alternative assets. The group is licensed and regulated in six jurisdictions, and we manage around $2 billion. Now, let me perhaps start with uh, a couple of questions on, on investing. And you have many years um, uh, advising and investing yourself. And I want to ask you, what are common investment mistakes people make in this environment? Perhaps you can share with us your experience, David. Honey, uh, that's a great question. I think first and foremost is a big mistake is letting your passions and emotions control you, uh, not only in stocks uh, and in the stock market, but in the bond market, in the currency market, uh, and also in individual stocks. So people can get, let themselves get carried away. Uh, the second mistake I think is not exercising patience and caution. This is a time to move with deliberateness, uh, with care. Another thing is people follow the news so intensely, and this is magnified and concentrated as we sit in self-quarantine and self-isolation and social distancing, is following the news so intensely that you lose sight of the longer-term perspective. As you said, uh, we've had the great financial crisis in 2008, 2009. You had the dot-com bust in uh, 1999, 2000. Uh, so you need to basically try to place this in perspective. And I think that's a mistake that people make. Another one is people move too quickly uh, and in immoderate amounts. So they say, oh, this is exciting. Uh, this uh, cruise ship operator or this airline has dropped in price. Buffett went into it. I'm going to go into it. But do this in, in baby steps. Another one is letting one loss paralyze you. So I've seen people over the years, um, like the story in the Bible of Jesus and going looking for one sheep while the other 99 sheep. And basically people let one, one investment overrule their psychology. Um, I think another one before I wrap up is uh, confusing secular, cyclical and secular movements. We are in uh, a secular bull market and this is make no mistake this is a much needed cleansing purging catharsis purification of 11 years of economic growth 11 years of uh stock market expansion a 34 year bull market in bonds that started in 1981 actually next next year will be 40 years 39 years uh, not exercising patience and caution and lastly, and look, I could go on, but I, I think uh, you have some other questions, but um, every one of us needs to have, this is the most important of all, every one of us needs an Uncle Frank. Everyone needs someone that we can talk to and they say, that's a good idea. Or they say, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. Do not do that. Do not do that. And so we need, and honey, I thank you. You've been my Uncle Frank in many regards uh, over the lo lovely time that we've known each other. And you've told me, David, this is a good idea. That's a bad idea. So that's the last mistake is people get isolated and they, they get these ideas into their head and they don't bounce them off someone that they respect who wants to see them do well. Thanks for that. You know, I'm, I was thinking through your first couple of comments and I'm reminded of the old Mike Tyson quote, 
everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face. And that's where we're at. Um, yes. People lose perspective and they lose their discipline. Um, so I wonder, you know, as you look through this now, how do you think, what are the indicators that you look for? How, how are you interpreting, uh, distinguishing between the signals and the noise? Honey, I think the three most important markers uh, in terms of the temperature. Now, this is first a temperature. That's the oil price. It's the 10-year treasury and it's the dollar. Those are the three indicators of health. Is the, is the temperature elevated? Is the temperature too low, too high? Another thing in the economy, then we go to the economy. That's the temperature. Then the economy. You look at employment. That leads to consumer confidence. That leads to consumer spending. And also, of course, the Fed and the uh, government authorities, the fiscal authorities. What is the government and what are the authorities trying to do? You do not want to fight the Fed. You do not want to fight the authorities. You want to see what they're buying and you want to do the same. Now, it, lastly, the indicators I watch as far as the stock and bond markets. One is the volatility index. That's the so-called VIX. When that's very high, it's an indication of major panic and concern, which is a good time to start putting money into the market. When it's too low, you want to go slow. The second one is new lows in the stock market. Uh, many of my mentors over the years have told me when there's 1,000 or 1,500 new lows, then it's time to start putting money in. Last week, there were many days when there were 2,500 new lows on the New York Stock Exchange. The third indicator is the bodyguards of the market. This is the bank stocks, this is the transportation stocks, and this is the small and mid-cap stocks. If they are underperforming the market, honey, you're not going to do well in the market overall. Watch the bodyguards, and I'll watch them, not just year to date, but on a day-to-day -day basis. Have they started to turn? Because when they start to do better, then the market can do better. The final um the final two, one is a double bottom. And when the market sells off, it could be stocks, it could be currencies, it could be commodities. When it cannot go any lower, no matter how bad the news is, that's finished. There's no more selling. The selling is exhausted. And the last one is when stocks or bonds, uh, high yield bonds, something goes up, not down on bad news. That's another indication that the worst is over and it's time to get a little bit more constructive and aggressive. Interesting, David. And when you think about um, the big fiscal and monetary stimulus that's happened, the CARES Act, what's been the perception on the ground about the US uh, government's fiscal and monetary response? Is it enough? Is it too much? Is it too slow? Is it too fast? Just give us your color based on comparisons with previous times. The speed of the economic slowdown has been matched this time with this swift uh, and massive response on the monetary side. I would say a swift response on the fiscal side that has not yet uh, been fully uh, implemented, number one, nor has it, I think there's more to come perhaps on the fiscal side, that you want to remember, honey, that all assets are driven by everything, real estate in the region, real estate in Saudi Arabia, real estate in Hong Kong, New York, stocks, bonds, gold, everything is driven by fundamentals, by valuation, and by psychology. And at the most important times in an assets price history, the biggest driver when there's great pessimism at the bottom is psychology. And when there's too much optimism at the top, that is psychology. So that ties in back to the first thing in terms of keeping, keeping your cool stocks. I believe psychologically that we are in a trading range up, down, up, down over a few years. Could we make another bottom? Possibly. No one knows. Uh, has the bottom been reached? Possibly no one knows. I think there's more bad news to come, uh, but we are basically, I believe, that started, you can say it started in 2009. We are in a secular bull market that people looking back on this are going to be surprised and delighted 
with the advances that are going to be made, biotechnology, 5G, okay, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, machine learning, okay, these things are going to drive the market to new highs, and we have to be very, very careful. In bonds, however, bonds, this monetary stimulus, I think could, in the, in the end, uh, lead to a currency, uh, a less valued currency, and uh, the bond market has been in a 39-year bull phase, and it is in extreme bullishness. You've seen negative interest rates. You and I have talked about this. Foreign currencies, you had the Reagan dollar and high interest rates with Paul Volcker. That was one big move up. In foreign currencies, you had the Clinton and internet dollar. That was another big bull up. Now this one has been at the interest rates being higher in the United States than other places. And to some degree, the shale dollar, the shale dollar is not there anymore with oil prices uh, below $20 a barrel. Um, in commodities, lastly, in commodities, we're totally washed out. This has been the last 10 years, a financial assets decade, not a real assets decade. And certain thought leaders in our world, in the world of investments, are beginning to think about when we get out of this, what is the next decade going to look like? And it very well may be a time to be looking uh, at real assets. Interesting. You mentioned during your comments sort of midway about market psychology because it's hard here to figure out valuations given we don't know what the E is in the in PE, right? Because it's still too early. How do you think about where we are in terms of market psychology here? What what what's going through people's minds? And I understand this time around we also have the interference of passive money. You talked about machines being involved in the market, but from a human element, where where do you think we are? Well, I think, first of all, we have to keep in mind market structures change, but human emotions do not change in 10,000 years of human recorded history. And that is people are going to have fear moments and they're going to have greed moments. And our friend Warren Edward Buffett, who was born on August the 30th, 1930, uh, this year, he will be 90 years old. OK, uh, he has said repeatedly that. Uh, you want to be fearful when others are greedy and you want to be greedy when others are fearful. Right now, uh, we have basically uh, the market fell 34 percent from February 19th. Uh, that was the peak of the st uh, stock market, 3300 on the S&P. It fell 34 percent to a March 23rd low. Uh, so psychology, the question is now we've had a big drop. Will there be another trauma? The word trauma comes from the Greek word to wound. Uh, and I know you know a lot of Greek based on where you spent vacations. <laughs> uh, the, uh, I'm, able to go the this market, I'm a little concerned, honey, about the bond market uh, bullishness, where you have these negative interests all over the world. Uh, you have uh, a great, I think the next two years, you don't have to worry too much about uh, bonds, but looking out beyond two years, you want to think very, very carefully uh, and make sure uh, that your bonds are structured from a maturity standpoint and a quality standpoint or your private your private credit, whatever it is you have. That's basically you're relying on for income. That's very, very important uh, psychologically. So bond stock market uh, commodities bearish stock market. We've had a bear e uh, episode. Uh, will it continue? Maybe. OK, I, I think there's a good chance we retest the lows, but I, I'm not dogmatic about that uh, in bonds, excessive bullishness. However, you look at Japan and Japan has been in this situation. You're very close there. Japan has been in this situation of very low interest rates for a dec two decades. 1989 was the peak of that market. And look at it now. It's almost three decades. So uh, psychologically, uh, this is a psychological, our, our main function in life is not only to help people do things, but it's to help people not do things, honey. That's why we, that's why we have the family office to help people do the right things and avoid doing the wrong things. That's another one of Buffett's mantras, basically keep the losers to a minimum. 
really interesting you uh, conjured up uh, Warren Buffett, and I know you've talked to him many times in the past. You may have seen over the weekend uh, in the Wall Street Journal that Charlie Munger was interviewed, and he's also, I guess people were expecting them to be bringing out the guns given the massive reserves they have, uh, 100 billion plus of cash on the Berkshire balance sheet, and yet he's holding fire. Were you surprised at that comment, uh, David? Uh, I enjoyed that interview and I enjoy him. I've managed to um, see him in person a couple of times uh, over the years. Uh, you know, he was born, honey, in uh, January 1st, 1924. And this coming year, he will be 97 years old on January 1st. Uh, he's, in very good shape. he's in very good shape mentally, as you could tell from the interview. And the interviewer also commented on how mentally acute and quick uh, Charlie Munger is. Uh, they put some money, as you know, into uh, Occidental Petroleum in a preferred share uh, situation when Oxy took over Anadarko, as you know. Uh, they paid $38 billion for it. The total market capitalization of Occidental today is $12 billion. And uh, the Occidental CEO had to pay Buffett not in cash, but in additional shares, 1.9% of Occidental. Uh, she uh, had to pay him this as the uh, dividend payment this quarter. Where am I going with this? The cash, they've been holding fire. And this is where I come back to patience. When there's, you want to basically bet seldom. This is one of Buffett's mantras. Bet seldom uh, and then bet big. Bet George big. Soros, and we all have heard of George Soros. He has said, it's not whether you're right or wrong. It's what you do in consequence of being right. And when you are right. So when they came to uh, Soros, they came to him uh, in 1992 when the pound broke and went out of the exchange rate mechanism, the ERM, and the pound dropped. And the the two money managers came to him uh, with a, uh, a total investment of $6 billion. And they were going to put $2 billion to bet against the pound. And Soros said to them, how strongly do you feel about this? And they said, we have never felt more strongly about this than anything else. And he said, in that case, let's leverage up and put $8 billion to work, not $2 billion to work. And so this is really, uh, I think, Buffett and Munger, as they sit there, uh, they're, they're exercising patience. And I just want to reiterate something we said at the beginning of this call. You need to have the coolness and the calm and the self-discipline and the self-control of a surgeon who is operating on his own daughter. Now, in the medical profession, you're not allowed to operate on your own family members because emotions get into it. But in an emergency, you are allowed. And we are in unusual, somewhat emergency times. And we, each of us, need to have the cool, the calm, the uh, self-control to operate on our own child without messing up. And there's where Buffett, I think, and, and Munger are holding fire. They have, you'll love this, as you know, uh, their portfolio. Now, this is not the companies. This is the stocks they own. Their portfolio, uh, as of the end of 2019, honey, cost them $110 billion and it was worth $180 billion. They have a $70 billion profit, okay, capital gains. That's over 55 years. And of that $70 billion profit, 72% of it come from four stocks. Four stocks. And I've Charlie Munger told me one day, David, we've had five ideas in 54 years. And you act on them. And I think this is really what the family office is uh, focused on, is be very careful, be selective, okay? Pay attention to diversification, pay very close attention to manager selection, and pay attention. Nobody pays attention. Now they're doing this. Pay attention to risk management. This is the essence of asset allocation. It's not merely about diversification, but it's also about risk management. What could go wrong? Buffett bought a hamburger company. I'm not going to say the hamburger, but look, it's like, it's like, okay. 
they, he bought a hamburger company and it wasn't doing what he wanted to do. And he sold it. Okay. He didn't hold it for 54 years. He sold it two years later. So uh, I'm intrigued. Buffett and Munger have the highest percentage in that 170 billion um, that they've ever had in banks, honey, in banks. Financial Let's institutions. talk about that because at the family office, as you know, we've been, we've played the banks really well uh, through multiple cycles. And uh, I know we've been looking closely and are, are actually deploying capital soon in the bank space because of our, our thoughts on valuation. I'm curious to hear how you're thinking about the banks, because uh, that's an important part of the sector. And to me, it strikes me that this time around, they're, they're part of the solution. They're not part of the problem, which they were back in 2009, 2008. Um, how do you think about valuations? How do you think about positioning for them as you look out two, three years? Because as you know, we're long-term investors. We're not really looking at the next two to three months, right? Honey, I think the banks would represent a classic example of a value investment uh, on a price to book basis, price earnings basis. Return on assets is the highest it's been in 80 years. Return on equity is not at that same exalted level. Why? Because the equity base has been built up. Uh, the Fed has been very, very uh, judicious uh, and very strict on the banking industry to rebuild. And so the banks, when you put, add all these together, it's the cheapest in 35 years. They have very strong capital position. And as you just highlighted, they have government support. They are now an agent of getting uh, the, the economy going again. I think as people look at banks uh, and look, they're going to put the banks are the agent. They're going to put three hundred and fifty billion dollars. They've already done that lending to small businesses with government guarantees. So the bank is not on the hook for that. The government is guaranteeing this. And then Stephen Mnuchin, my old student at Yale, you recall, I taught the Treasury Secretary at Yale. He uh, has given the Fed. 500 billion that Fed can now leverage 10 times. So by the time you get um, 500 billion times 10 is 5 trillion, and you add on another 350 billion, and there'll be more. You're talking close to 6 trillion that is going to work through the banking uh, sector. The, uh, the last thing I would say about the banks, honey, is concentrate on the three Ds always. And this is the same thing in the oil industry, okay? Discipline. You want capital discipline. You want diversification. You want a bank that's not just consumer, not just business, not just real estate. You want a bank that has diversification and then dividend sanctity. Now, I did notice uh, that the European Central Bank has asked the banks in Europe uh, to go very slow or even uh, to uh, cut dividends. That's right. Dividends and stock buybacks uh, in the United States. Uh, we'll see how this develops, but I, the um, dividend sanctity. Uh, and I just finished reading Jamie Dimon of J.P. Morgan, his uh, uh, 2019 letter. And I see uh, very powerful banking institutions uh, are prepared uh, when they get the green light and the dividend sanctity will be there. And they're well, well aware of this and they have uh, discipline and they have diversification. So. I'm, I think the banks are a classic value play here. Fantastic. Let me ask you uh, maybe one last question before we revert to some of the questions. I'm seeing a lot of questions now coming up from the chat box. Uh, and I'd encourage the audience to continue to put through their questions. Um, you know, credit versus equity, you touched on this earlier. Where do you think we've got relative value today? And... Um, where would you put your money today? Honey, I think private credit right now uh, is a good place to be. It's not to downplay or to negate private equity, but I think of the two, uh, private credit deserves focus. Uh, you're getting basically, uh, because of the mispricings and because of the sell-off here, you're getting stock-like returns with bond-like uh uh, bond like reach bond like right. protection you know and that's i think uh that's a very very uh it's a once in a short once in a while type of thing the positioning 
through private credit, the positioning in the capital structure is at another level, another higher level. And I think that's important. You want to focus, you and I have talked about this for a long time, on the higher quality end of the spectrum. I think you don't want to chase too high yields. John D. Rockefeller, the founder of the Standard Oil Company, he lived to be 99 years old. I think he was born in 1837 and died in 1936, something like this. Don't, it's not perfect, but something like this. And he said, more money has been lost by people improperly chasing yield than in all of the bank robberies in human recorded history. <laughs> you want to be very, very careful in terms of chasing yield. If it's got too high a yield, there may be something wrong with it. And the, um, the manager selection is another thing. So the manager selection is paramount in private equity, private credit. The difference between a, a good student, an A student, and a C student in bonds is very low. But in private equity, private credit, it can be very high. So you want to be very, very judicious and very demanding in how, uh, in how you select private, uh, private credit uh, and private equity. But I, I prefer private credit right here. Thank you. Thank you, David. We, we, again, also at the family office have been looking at that space and are as well deploying capital, particularly in the high yield market, which caught a big, a big time bid, as you know, from uh, the Fed only last week and took uh, what seemed to be a massively dislocated market up by 10 points when no one really expected it. So it's fascinating what we're going through right now. I'm going to switch to some of these questions that are coming through David, on the uh, chat box here, and there's quite a few. If I would summarize maybe three that are asking the same question, which is, in your opinion, how long would it take for these economies to recover from this outbreak? Uh, what, what does it look like? You know, what does a recovery pickup look like from here? Uh, and I don't think this is specific to the United States. I, the comments seem to be broad. They're more global. The questions seem to be broad. So perhaps you can shed some light on your on your opinion here. Well, honey, that's a I think a extremely critical question. And to what how fast will we recover and to what degree will we recover? And this is obviously going to depend very much on the severity and duration of the economic shock as it continues to play out in the United States, in Europe, okay, in Asia. And then, God bless the emerging markets. And these, these, many of these developing countries, the coronavirus crisis, COVID-19, has just begun to uh, wave into them. Uh, it's coming in from the various travel. It's coming in from uh, spreading within the countries. So I think the, uh, the time period and, and how, how much will we recover? How much will we recover? One part of me says there's a pent up demand. People are going crazy. They've been in their house with their families for two weeks, three weeks. They're going crazy and they want to get out. They want to go to a concert. They want to go to a restaurant. They want to go. They want to go to some entertainment. OK, um, they want to go shopping. So one part of me and in some ways in the northern hemisphere, we're coming into summertime. Now people will. I think. Uh, it, there's a psychological opening up here. If this were happening as we were going into December with days getting shorter and shorter, I think this would be uh, the subject of a, a psychological uh, meltdown and crisis. So I, part of me says it's the severity, and this depends on the four T's in the United States. This is testing. This is critical. And I heard on the radio this morning, that it's only 3 million tests they've done in the United States. This, the United States is 330 million people. That's 1% of the people have been tested. So you need testing to be more broad spread where you can find out whether people have the antibodies, whether they've had it. We need to see, honey, about the, uh, will this come back? Will there be a second wave? Will people catch it again? Okay, this is a, a special uh, disease. The word virus, you may know this, it, the word virus is the Latin word for poison. Virus means poison. And how, how bad is this poison uh, affecting our, our, uh, our system? The uh, second T, so testing. Then you need, uh, you need uh, tracing of people. 
where are the people going? You know, this has been, you've told me about Hong Kong and uh, in parts of Asia where they've been able to basically with a, with an app of some sort, they've been able to track you, uh, track you, you know, and you, you, if they tell you to quarantine, you've got to stay at, at home. Okay. Uh, so the third T is treatment. And there we, I have not in one month, the biotech industry, and they've been collaborating. I've just been so excited to see um, the uh, the collaborative efforts of the many entities. 170, according to Bloomberg Business Week and Refinitiv, 170 companies are working on. Um, they 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 basically decoded the genome. Okay, within a, a month, uh, that would have stuff that took 18 months. So if we can see. Um, a treatment, a therapeutic treatment, and a preventive treatment. Um, that will be, I think, will also influence your question. And lastly, is time. And I think people need they need to forget about how bad this was and say, you know what, life goes on. I'm going to I'm going to take a trip. I'm going to take a vacation. I think you will see various parts of the economy recover faster to an old level than other parts of the economy. And as you and I have discussed, I think there's, uh, there is a uh, long-term shift. People, it's become very easy. You know, I, I've ordered a, I've ordered all kinds of stuff that I never used to order, honey, um, it, because it's so easy now. And I think we, that's going to shift how we uh, behavior. We've become this is basically a trial for the real crisis that someday when we have a real crisis, this is bad. Okay. People are dying. People are getting sick, but this is a trial run. This is a practice game for us to prepare ourselves better for the real storm. I think people have become more sensitive to tail risk. You and I, when we've gone on meetings together in Hong Kong, when we've gone on meetings together in Zurich, in London, you and I to visit investors, in the region, in Saudi Arabia, in Kuwait, okay, in um, Abu Dhabi. When we've gone to visit people, basically, often I'm not so sure that they've concentrated on the tail risk, the risk of us of an event over here at the far end of the spectrum having a big impact. And I think people will be much more focused on tail risk, and they'll be more focused and more resilient when we come out of this. We're going to be like, you said, Mike Tyson, we're going to be like a prize fighter that has taken the worst blows to the face that the other person can punch and we've recovered and we're stronger as a result. I think people are going to be more demanding, more discerning and more discriminating, just like my late wife, God bless, God rest her soul. When we used to go to a hotel in the south of France, they would give me the worst room in the hotel. And I would say to my wife, this is going to be just fine. She would say the famous spouse words, five words. This just will not do. This just will not do. And people are going to be a lot more discerning and demanding coming out of this thing, which I think will affect uh, the severity and duration of the, um, of the, the recovery. Thank you, David, for that um, answer. If I can ask you to shorten them, because I'm getting quite a few uh, questions coming through now. Um, one here is, do you foresee any trade-related issues arising from China, with China, given the political comments coming out of the White House? And the rhetoric, as you, I'm just uh, editing that a little bit, but the rhetoric has become a lot more anti-China. What does that mean? Are we looking at... Um, you know, a potential for uh, an escalation in this uh, in these trade related this trade related war. Could there be another escalation, perhaps uh, something more severe than that? How do you think about that? Well, China, China, uh, you and I and I just so appreciate and value the insights that you uh, from your proximity, uh, your long experience and involvement in that region. Uh, that you've helped shed light on me and the articles you've sent me, Hani, from the South China Morning Post and from other sources in the in the in Asia. I think, um, look, in a crisis, people are going to blame others. <laughs> it's natural. You can look at the Bible. 
You can look at the Quran, okay? In a crisis, human, human, we get pushed back against the wall and we, we become like uh, animals or we become like fighting siblings. You've got three children. I have two children. And you've seen them fight. They love one another. Uh, and you've seen them fight with great <laughs> ferocity and savagery and call each other names. Uh, and I hope that uh, we are going to enter a new era of coexistence, of cooperation, of collaboration. I hope that. I, this is an election year in the United States. And, you know, i got to believe that Trump, when he calls his friend, he claims that Xi Jinping is his friend. When he calls him on the phone, I'm sure he says to him, look, I'm going to say some bad things about you and your country, but I don't mean them. I have to do it to my political base. That's his political base. On the other side of the aisle, they're, they're saying that Trump, the, the, today's New York Times, the lead story was how Trump is demonizing China uh, and so forth and so on. This is a, You can go back 10,000 years. When bad things happen, we want to blame others, you know? And look, it's, it's natural. It's part of the human uh, self-preservation. I am hopeful that out of this, we'll have a better balance to the relationship. This is what you need in a, in a partnership. This is what you need in a marriage. And none of us like to see our parents fighting with each other. We all grew up as children. You have a beautiful family, honey. I know how, about you, how you've grown up. And you want to see your parents getting along. You don't want to see your parents fighting. And our parents today, the world's parents, are the U.S. and China. And let's hope that they can uh, use this as an opportunity to, uh, they can call each other names. Fine, that's going to happen. I just want to see them stay married. I believe they will stay married. And I believe they're in a relationship of a better balance and better equanimity and better equality. This is what, and I think the world, the world is going to look back on this and say, wow, that was a real crisis. Uh, we got through it. But I think the advances that each is going to help the other. The U.S. is going to help China. The China's helping U.S. And the rhetoric, the rhetoric is going to get worse between now and November 3rd. Tuesday, November 3rd, that's the election. The rhetoric's going to get worse. People are going to call each other even worse names. And I hope that Donald John Trump, President Trump, when he gets on the phone to Xi Jinping, I hope he says to him, I don't mean it. I don't mean it. I just got to say this. And I hope Xi Jinping says the same to Trump. They seem to get along. And I think this is this is very important. I am of the opinion that we are uh, we're going through a rough patch and marriages, relationships, friendships. They go through rough patches and they often come out better and stronger and more balanced of after disagreements and arguments and name calling and nasty rhetoric. I sure hope. Uh, thank you for that uh, illuminating uh, commentary. It's very inspiring. And I hope you're, uh, and I know you've got a lot of connections in the current administration. I hope that they're listening to you um, and thinking about those comments in the same way, because it is a, a critical relationship that uh, for which we're going to need to see uh, cooperation and collaboration, as you said. And I think one of the things that doesn't get reported often in the press, certainly through this political rhetoric, is that actually the Chinese scientists shared the genome uh, and the protein for COVID-19 with other scientists in the United States as well as in Europe. And that doesn't get reported, but this happened actually in January. And that's kind of, you know, uh, corroborated your comments about so many of these um, uh, scientists and labs and institutions working together to solve for a solution. And I sure hope they uh, they feel the same way that, that you do from a political angle. Let me shift gears here back to stocks and maybe putting back your, your old hat um, teaching valuation and uh, finance uh, back at Harvard. Um, one of the questions that came through is with interest rates at historically low levels and um, Given the uh, the movement of stock valuations here, is it still valid to look at multiples in light of historical averages? This question came yeah. through a couple of minutes ago. Honey, that's a great question. And you and I have talked about the technology sector and the intellectual property sector. 
and you look at social media companies and you look at the price to sales, okay, you take a company like Zoom right now. Zoom is selling for 45 times sales, not earnings, sales. You know why. Everybody knows why. Uh, I think um, valuation metrics in the era of intellectual property, uh, in the area era of uh, global brand dominance by some of these social media companies, they could be Chinese, they could be United States. I think some of the valuation metrics, uh, Buffett has always stressed. And look, he, he started with uh, Benjamin Graham. I, I wrote a book, McGraw-Hill asked me to write a book about Benjamin Graham, okay? And I, he was Buffett's teacher at Columbia Business School, as you know. And uh, Benjamin Graham is the father of value investing. Buffett, though, he saw Coca-Cola. It never got cheap. And he put... He bought 200 million shares of Coca-Cola after the crash of 1987, and he's never sold them. And it's one of the top four wins he's ever had. 17 billion, 14 billion profit. I don't know. It's split two for one. And you look at Buffett's letter every year. It shows 400 million shares. He's never sold a share. He bought 200, two for one split. He's got 400. And where I'm going with this is Charlie Munger and uh, Phil Fisher. He's the father of growth investing, just as our friend um, Benjamin Graham is the father of value investing. He told Buffett, you're never going to get this stock uh, like this uh, to grow with this return on equity. And I think this brings up something I want people to think about when they look at uh, when they look at different metrics. You talked about what indicators. Uh, Munger has stressed to me that a company its stock return over many years, not two years, but over many years is going to approximate very closely, not perfectly, but it's going to be near its average return on equity. And you see some great companies right now. I don't want to mention them by name, but there's a drug company this past week that raised its dividend for the 64th year in a row. Okay. And their return on equity for the last 10 years has been 22%. You can buy that stock. You can buy that that thing like a. You can buy it like a book and put it. There's the art of asset allocation by David Dars. You can put it, and I. You know, honey, what what do you like to do? I like to sit and look at my own books. You know, I like to see them on the shelf, and uh, um, you want. I have to I have many of them on my shelf as well, David. So I'm gonna I'm gonna interrupt you because we we've got limited time because. Uh, unless you wanted to conclude there, but there was another that's, comment. That's on that. Return on equity. Look, force yourself, force your financial advisor to give you the median ROE. Okay. These cruise lines. Okay. They're cheap on a short term basis, honey, but on a, on a long term basis, they only return 8% on equity. Okay. So I'll stop there. Got it. So a couple of questions that came through uh, that are similar in nature. One was talking about, you know, uh, your thoughts on whether inflation kicks in post fiscal stimulus. Um, and at what point, um, and this sounds premature to me, but you know, the question came in, you know, once the fed raises rates back in a year's time, you have a, a view on either of those inflation and rates. I think this is, this is like being on a ship in the ocean, a hundred years ago and we have to stand we have to have lookouts on top of the mast that are watching for potential storms that are watching for uh rocks and shoals so we have to constantly be on the lookout for possibly inflation to return and interest rates and inflation is going to be the driver of interest rates to come back up this has been declared by many people all over the world to be an actual armed conflict a war OK, against this uh, uh, COVID-19. All right. And therefore, a wartime response is called for. And this is one of the things that makes me positive. The government did not sit there and, and keep a blindfold. The government did not sit there and take its time. It took maybe maybe it could have happened in a week rather than two weeks or it could have happened in two weeks rather than four weeks. But still, it's been lightning fast. And so. Coming back to the inflation, I think inflation, I'm worried longer term about we want to basically have 
currency, uh, the purchasing power of money, that it is respected. Okay, this is, I think, uh, when I saw the speed with which the British pound lost its role as the world's premier reserve currency, it had that since the defeat of Napoleon, okay, at the Battle of Waterloo, all right, 1815, June 21st, 1815, 1815. it had this. Uh, and then it lost it, the speed with which it lost it. And I, therefore, I think the authorities, and what I love about the world these days, and you and I have shared many articles about uh, people sounding the alarm, people saying, uh, we've got to be careful as to how we do this. Uh, I am, for the time being, I think we have these deflationary forces still raging, and they are technology, they are globalization, okay, and they are uh, su supply chain, and that is globalization is, uh, and the internet basically lets you compare the price. If I want to buy, if I want to buy this cup of this Harvard cup of coffee, okay. I can go on now and find the cheapest price. Even on uh, the biggest online retailer in the United States, they show you the different the different price levels at which you can get some of this stuff. That's going to keep prices. Technology, tech, uh, technology, and the internet are keeping prices low. So I and think the world today, of course, it, and those are deflationary forces. You have the baby boomers retiring, honey, every day. Ten thousand more turn sixty-five. People born between 1964 and uh, 1946, 1964. Um, you have the, basically Japan. Uh, uh, people actually who are in retirement don't mind prices staying low or even going down a little bit because they're living on fixed income. So you have a fourth uh, argument in favor of prices uh, not exploding to the upside. So for now, but... You want to have a sailor, a member of your ship, on top of the mast, watching the horizon constantly, even though it's far away. It's a beautiful day. There's no shoals. There's no rocks. There's no storms. There's no clouds. But you must keep vigilant, as you just did with your question, and as that um, guest, honored guest, did with his and her question. Um, one of the other... Uh, deflationary forces right now is oil. And there was a question on oil. Uh, and I wonder whether you have a view on that. Is it knowable at this stage? Uh, and as you know, at the family office, we um, always advise clients and we have not invested in any energy or energy related names because we're diversifying away from that because we're naturally long that market in the Gulf. Do you have a view here um, and the implications of where we're at. Honey, uh, and I, I'm the Mohsen Al Omran, our founder and our leader and our inspiration daily. And we've had many conversations, you and I, you and he, and he and I, uh, and the insights uh, that I have gained over the years about oil pricing. Uh, you have... Uh, you have a very, very, uh, it's in flux. It's fluid right now. Uh, I, you've seen cases of oil uh, selling for $7 a barrel in, Henry, in the uh, uh, Cushing, Cushing, Oklahoma. You've seen it for $5 a barrel. You've seen negative oil prices recently. This is not everything. This is not the futures, but where people pay you to take the oil away because there's no place to put it. So I think the oil... Uh, the oil part of the equation is extremely, extremely important. I personally think if you can find the oil companies, and look, we don't recommend this in the family office, but oil companies that have discipline, that have uh, capital, a diversity of operations, upstream, midstream, downstream, and they have dividend sanctity, okay? Uh, I think this is a, this is a place I, th I could see people going into the oil sector as a substitute that day when we come back to inflationary worries being much more severe than they are now. You could go back. You could see that oil securities, stocks and bonds could be bought rather than 
normal fixed income securities for their dividend uh, and for their exposure to real assets. Oil, uh, I, I meant to say this to you earlier, and I started looking at your picture and I got all, I got all excited. <laughs> now, honey, uh, you want to see the stock market go up quite a bit. You want to see the stock market go up and uh, things rally and we're finished. Just show me uh, Trump and Putin and Trump and Xi Jinping uh, having a more uh, cooperative, collaborative uh, series of dialogues. The market will go wild to the upside and the oil price as well. The demand, 100 million barrels a day production, demand they say is going to fall 30, 25, 30 million barrels a day. No one knows the cuts. 9.7 plus another five plus plus a few more, you know, Libya, Venezuela. Uh, I, to me, oil is going to be sloppy for a while. And there's where you need this demanding, discerning and discriminating uh, view. Uh, and I, I, I look to Abdul Mohsen al Abran and uh, uh, his wisdom and his long uh, experience and exposure uh, to, to the area, to the sector. Oil is playing into geopolitics in the region as well. You have other things going on. You have conflict uh, between different parts. And so oil is, uh, oil has moved into a new sphere. It is not merely, it is not merely a, a economic, but it is a geopolitical uh, item. And so I think you have to factor that in uh, as you as you think about oil, uh, I'm attracted to oil here, but I'm much more attracted to the banks right now. Got it. Thank you, David. Um, it's interesting when we were talking about the change in consumption patterns and uh, people. I'm still getting a lot of questions on sort of recovery. How long would it take? What does it look like? Employment, etc. I thought I'd share with you, seeing that I'm in in Hong Kong and in China that we've had a certain bout of what you were saying, pent up demand, what is being described as revenge spending uh, in certain sectors, including jewelry, not sure why, uh, in China. Uh, but we've also had new home sales in March that were triple the number in February. Again, pent up demand. Remember that market was shut down for a month and you're, you're seeing a recovery still 24, 25% below 2019. And I'm talking about the top 30 cities in China, but it's interesting that uh, you are seeing some of that revenge spend. New normal, lower, but still there because people want to get out once they have a chance to get out. Uh, and uh, and I'm hopeful that we, we see some of that come through. It probably comes at different grades in each market. As you know, a lot of markets in China has been able to bend that curve much more aggressively. I hope the US is able to bend the curve sooner rather than later, if not just for the human toll that it's uh, and cost uh, that it's taking. But I want to go back to that. You know, when you think about these changes in, uh, in consumption habits and you touched on real assets, um, let me let me uh, let me ask you, there was a question that came through here on the REITs and whether you have a view on the REITs, because again, in the US, it's a very broad, deep sector, right? Because you've got REITs that are retail. You have lodging REITs, you have commercial office space, you got industrial, and of course you have residential and the commercial uh, mortgage, mortgage bond market, which, which is a whole different set of issues and has you know, different um, levels of leverage on them. Any thoughts on the REITs? And this is a long-winded uh, question that, that came through from the audience, appreciate it. Well, real estate investment trusts, apartment buildings, shopping centers, office buildings and uh, hotels. And you mentioned industrial as well, honey. So you, you have this, they've been a yield play. They pay out 90% to, to stay a REIT. They have to pay out 90% of their earnings. Therefore, they have to go back to the capital markets. As long as the capital markets are open and they have access and they can get money at these low rates, and that also influences the capitalization rate. So in real estate investment trusts, uh, you've seen certain sectors. So business travel for hotels and and uh, uh, holiday travel, is that going to affect them? 
I would say it'll be a while till it gets back to its old robustness. Um, the retail sector, we've all heard stories and a very, very uh, well-known uh, department store chain, which is very, very elegant. And it, I, I did not like it when my late wife went into this store shopping uh, because the prices are very high. One of the nicknames for this company was Needless Markup. Okay, I'll let, you try, I'll, let you, I'll let you figure out what company that is. But they said on the radio this morning that they're thinking about filing for bankruptcy protection. And that affects the shopping centers, the malls that many of these uh, people. You, you come back to the three Ds, discipline, diversification, and dividend uh, sanctity, that they really uh, respect the dividend. And it's not uh, a, a play toy or a play thing. Uh, in terms of real estate investment trusts, I think you want to be especially uh, careful, especially uh, demanding. Uh, there are going to be some phenomenal uh, bargains. They're going to be some. They're going to be like Rembrandt paintings laying on the driveway in a tag sale. Okay, where you can pick up tremendous uh, companies. Uh, I think uh, the real estate they have to borrow money. Okay, to keep growing. They have to, um, they have to, uh, they, they compete with other yield plays because they're a dividend play uh, and the, uh, the cap rate. Those are the three, uh, their asset underlying them. So if you can buy companies that have good management, strong track record, and I want to see people that have managed through, there are certain families that have managed through tremendous crises, the dot-com bust, the great financial crisis. They've managed through cycles. And so you want to see the last one is cyclical experience. How have they managed? Have they managed? Have they been able to right size uh, their asset base? So real estate investment trust blanket. I cannot tell you. Uh, I'm much more sanguine and more constructive. I don't want to repeat myself about the banks and the financial sector. Uh, then you want to be very, very uh, discerning and discriminating uh, within the real estate investment trust space, honey. Thank you, David, for that. I got another couple of questions here, again, asking about U.S. unemployment and U.S. unemployment benefits. Sorry, I'm switching gears here, but I'm just okay. responding to the questions that are coming through. Um, and, you know, the question is, you know, do the unemployment benefits fill in the consumer spending gap um, as it came through? Uh, well, one. Payroll, the PPP, the Payroll Protection Program, you've read about this. It has already run out of money. Uh, I I've think heard, that, David, for the benefit of the audience. You know, I was hoping you would not ask me that question, honey. <laughs> I think it was. I think it was three hundred and fifty billion. But three fifty is the number I had in my head. Yes, uh, you're right. But uh, the payroll protection plan, apparently they've exhausted that. And that's the number I had in my head. The, uh, I think you're going to see, you'll see more money put in there because this is, this is basically mom and pop. This is the mainstream. This is the people who do the real work. This is the heroes. This is the nurses, teachers, okay, firefighters, police officers. These are the people who really need uh, some of them are employed. Some of them have lost. You see the jobless numbers. And I think the unemployment number is going to spike. Look, I heard uh, uh, my another one of my students, Richard Kaplan, he's now the president of the Dallas Fed. OK. And he was on television this morning saying that uh, that unemployment could get up, you know, well above 20 percent or maybe even close to 30 percent. Uh, we will see uh, whether that whether that plays out. Uh, I think you're gonna, but the you, you're gonna see the higher that gets, the bigger the response will be from Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell. Nancy Pelosi as the leader of the Democrats, Mitch McConnell, McConnell as the leader of the Republicans. She's in the House, he's in the Senate. So the bigger, the the worse that news, I think the more powerful the the response will be from the government because this is mainstream. It's one thing to bail out America's largest airplane manufacturer. And you know what company that is. Okay. It's one thing to bail them out. It's one thing to help out uh, the, the automobile companies, but companies versus the people who are doing the work for the companies. And that I think is, um, that is very, very high up on the congressional uh, agenda. Honey is 
uh, getting more money into the hands of the people who've got filed for unemployment benefits. The other thing I've read and heard this weekend is that there have been delays. Many of these, oh my gosh, unemployment uh, uh, benefit sites have been so loaded that they've, you know, they've crashed or they've, they, the delays have been just unbelievable. So you and I are sitting here, we're wearing a tie, we're able to work from home, but the people who do the work in this economy, the people who deliver things, the people who give you food in the supermarket. And on the food thing, uh, going back to inflation, there was uh, an incident uh, over the last few days where they've talked about the coronavirus uh, has spread within uh, certain parts of the meat processing industry. And that, I think, has raised people's, I think, more than anything, just like in China, the pork, uh, the swine, this, uh, the swine flu, how badly it decimated the pork production. And that influenced the uh, uh, the inflation numbers, honey. You recall, uh, you told me about this. So uh, I think the, uh, the payroll protection plan is like a, um, uh, it's like this cup that it needs a refill. It needs a refill. I think the, uh, what's interesting to me, at least going through the numbers, because is how staggering the response has been. I mean, we're talking about uh, when you combine the fiscal and monetary stimulus, you know, we went from 10 to 20 percent of GDP. Now we're talking about 25, possibly to 30 percent of GDP. I mean, these guys are going to keep printing and they're going to throw everything they can at this. Never in a peacetime has a government thrown this much money at a problem before we even had a recession. And so um, we'll we'll see. I think you're you're right. I mean, uh, you're going to have bipartisan bipartisan support for this, and uh, and um, let's uh, let's see how this works out. Maybe um, you know one last uh, thought, perhaps that you want to leave with people here on. Um, how to manage through this both at the human level and at an investor level before we uh, before we wrap up. Just some words of wisdom from uh, from you, my mentor. Well, I think it's very important that we feel a sense of gratitude, uh, that we look for the silver lining in this. I think uh, the infrastructure is working. Let's hope it doesn't have any cracks or breaks. So there's a sense of gratitude. There's a sense of appreciation. There's a sense of closeness that we've been able to feel with our families. Maybe they're not in the same room with us. Maybe it's by video or by telephone. I think we've been able to reappreciate. You've seen, you and I have received millions of uh, emails and uh, videos that people have sent about they're funny or else they're about the uh, the COVID-19 crisis, uh, there's this fake stuff that's sent around and we make the mistake of sending it around ourselves, uh, that we think it's the new solution. Uh, but I think we've, we've gained a, a moment of pause, a moment of reflection. And in this time, I would just say, uh, set yourself a couple of goals. Don't, don't let yourself get like you're in a, uh, in, in prison or on a ship where you're in a long voyage and your whole metabolism, your mental metabolism begins to slow down. Figure out, make yourself a couple of objectives. I'm going to, I'm going to clean out three closets. I'm going to go through and my suits and I'm going to finally donate some, okay, that, that have been sitting there. Get a couple of things done. Write an article, okay? Read, read a book. Reread a book, okay? Yes, binge People binge watching Netflix, fine, but do something that uh, improves you as a person and adds luster, that adds polish, that adds brightness. And you know what? Uh, I've received calls and it's made me call certain people. You and I speak almost every day, okay? But I've received calls from people I haven't heard from in years and I've caught up with them. And do that, surprise someone. It will make you feel better surprise someone call them up and say i was thinking about you and i just want you to know i have great admiration and affection for you and your family and this is this is a this is this is what came into my head today when you get a call like that it makes you feel tremendous 
even though we have this crisis around us. And this is our defense. Our defense is inside us, inside our minds, hearts, souls, and spirits. David, thank you for those um, words of wisdom. Um, you're absolutely right. There's nothing feels better than, especially in a time of crisis, uh, than helping other people. And uh, it's important to do that. We, I, I tell that to all the young folk that work with us as well, uh, that it's a, it's a great way to give back in our, in our own very, very modest way at the family office. We're trying to help with some of these market insights, frankly, uh, with our clients. Um, I want to thank you for your uh, wisdom, for your patience with a lot of my uh, annoying questions. Um, I hope we're able to do this webinar again uh, sometime soon. Uh, I'm going to put up, uh, you know, on my screen here, um, some numbers for, uh, for, for those of you that are on the call that want to reach out to the family office. Um, and, and an email address here if you have any questions. We're here for you. We're happy to do more of these webinars. As you all know, we uh, at the family office are very fortunate in our ability to uh, tap into multiple uh, markets around the world, multiple asset classes, as well as uh, a tremendous resource of our people that have um, a fair amount of experience uh, that they can share with you, uh, our clients, uh, and those of you who will soon be our clients. And I want to thank uh, David first and, and you for, for dialing into this uh, really uh, illuminating and fascinating conversation. And I hope uh, to come back and do this uh, over uh, the next couple of weeks uh, or perhaps uh, next month uh, so we can share with you our latest thoughts. Um, stay safe, stay strong, and stay in touch. Thank you so much for your time. Bye-bye. This concludes this call. Be continued, inshallah. <laughs>